Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to most of you. My name is Herb, and I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to our Big Book 12-step workshop. Please join me in prayer for an open mind. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps in you, for an open mind and a new experience of myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We've finally come to a place where we've finished the administration, the protocol, and the orientation and the introduction to the big book through the forwards and the prefaces. We've taken a deep look at the purpose. Why are we here and doing this work? Well, primarily, and I hope you have this as your priority, it's a spiritual awakening. And now we know what that means, a change a gift of grace, not without our attitude and action, but nevertheless. A result that exceeds our contribution to it. You may not have experienced that yet, but you can anticipate and expect it. We looked at steps 11 and 10, respectively, to incorporate them effectively in our journey as tools, operating tools, to keep the channel clear of obstacles, our disturbances, and to fill the channel with light through sitting in the presence of light, asking for guidance knowledge and power. So we're approaching step one now, formally tonight, for the very first time we begin the step process. The way I approach it now, after having done the work four different times with four different people over a 20 year period, is I have an understanding of human nature that's come to me from disciplines outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, but be reinforced by my experience with the big book and Bill Wilson's approach to the first step, actually. <clears throat> I'm not sure what his educational background was that led him to talk about a problem of the body, a problem of the mind, and a problem of the will. But that's how he articulates it in the big book. It's not the way he structured step one. He structured step one on the basis of the doctor's opinion, which is what we're going to look at right now. The doctor is Dr. Silkworth. He's a psychiatrist in the day which means he was a medical doctor with an MD, and he had a specialty training in psychoanalytic theory of Freud. So he was a psychiatrist. Due to his life circumstances, he found himself needing employment at the time that Towns Hospital, owned by Mr. Towns, needed a uh, 
medical doctor to run their alcohol and drug rehabilitation ward. Very unsophisticated by today's standards, but it was the best they could do at the time. In fact, it was actually pretty cutting edge to have an entire wing of a hospital dedicated to detox and recovery for drug addicts and alcoholics. And so Dr. Silkworth's opinion after years of processing and trying to help alcoholics and failing miserably. He had a theory that they have a problem with their body. He called it an allergy and a craving. We're gonna look at that for the next two weeks. But he also alluded to a problem of the mind, which stands to reason, he's a psychiatrist. But he didn't elaborate at all on the nature of that dysfunction. We have to wait until we get into the next assignment. This assignment is assignment three on the body. The next assignment, assignment four, will be on the mind. And Bill then elaborates his experience and understanding, his knowledge of what the problem is in terms of addiction and the mind he uses two terms that we'll look at very carefully, obsession and delusion. For Bill in the structure of the big book, that's his approach to step one and he ends his comments on step one on page 43 when he says, an alcoholic has no effective mental defense against the first drink. Then he starts chapter four, intending to start step two. That's not how we're going to do it because the third time I went through the steps, a man had a different insight in terms of the content, the real content of step one. It has a second half. What I've just talked about is the first half of the first step having to do with alcohol in the terms of the big book, but in terms of my own approach, I broaden it to addiction so that it encompasses all substance and process addictions, substance, alcohol, drugs, and food process, that very intangible addiction of fear or gambling or pornography or manipulation and control or codependency. Substance addiction has a substance, of course. Process addiction is much more subtle in one way, just as devastating in every way. And addiction, by my definition, is not scientific, but it works for me. And addiction is repetitive behavior over which we have no control that leads to negative consequences. Repetitive behavior over which we have no control, which leads to negative consequences. All of those component parts are necessary. The word commonly used for step one is powerless. We become so brain dead to it because we use it so often that it doesn't phase us to say powerless. We just rolls off our tongue as if it's, oh, it's raining outside type of comment. So I use the word no choice as a synonym. No choice. When I take a drink in my alcoholic addiction, intending to have a drink, it will set up a craving for more. That's the use of the term craving in the big book in the doctor's opinion. When you look up the word craving in a dictionary, that's not what you'll find. You'll find the word something like the anticipation of, the desire for, the feeling of a need. That's craving in a dictionary. That's not craving in the doctor's opinion. In fact, he very clearly says, and we'll look at it when we get there, the craving never happens until after you take the drink. The craving never happens until after you take the bite. 
the craving never happens until you, after you put down the chip gambling or open your computer with the intention of spending five minutes in pornography. Then the craving begins after you've engaged with the substance or the process. I have suggested that you look at the way of life document for the worksheet on the body to at least familiarize yourself with the questions that are asked. Not that you complete it, but again, ask yourself the questions and hold the questions while you're doing the assignment. And then after you finish the assignments, the reading assignments, the reflection re assignments, then look at those questions and do some writing about your own personal history with addiction. Because this is about getting some knowledge, as we'll see, identifying the real understanding of craving and allergy as the doctor uses it, but also having an experience with your own history. Not that you have to relapse in order to have the experience, but you look back on your personal history of your connection to food or whatever other addiction might be tagging you right now or in your past. I'll elaborate a little bit more on step one as we go forward. I think that's enough for right now in terms of the orientation of step one. It has two halves divided by a dash. Admitted we were powerless over alcohol. So for our purposes, since most of you are not alcoholic, admitted we were powerless over addiction and you have a substance addiction. But then there's a dash. Dash is not and. It's a sign in the English language that there's a connected but new thought, brand new thought, not necessarily connected to the first thought. My life isn't unmanageable because I'm an addict. Now, if I'm in my addiction, my life will be unmanageable, of course. Anybody who does anything to excess, their lives will be unmanageable. But what about the person who is a year abstinent, the person who is five years abstinent, the person who is 20 years abstinent? Dash, their life is unmanageable. What the big book means by that is unmanageable on my own human willpower. And we'll see that. Bill starts us out on page 45, looking at the will and the lack of willpower. And we'll look in places in chapter five, in chapter four, and then in chapter five, to get a full round understanding of and experience with what does unmanageability mean? Because Bill calls it the spiritual malady. The body problem is important, but not as, prob not as important as the mind problem. The mind problem is much more important than the body problem. The body problem is, I have suffering from my addiction. Well, for God's sake, stop it. Just stop it. Oh, yeah, well, I can't. Oh, then the mind problem is a bigger problem. I can't stay stopped. And Bill says that in step 10, we're not cured. What does he mean by that? It doesn't mean with regard to our addiction. It's very clear in step 10, we're placed in a position of neutrality. We have recovered from our addiction by finishing step nine. That's the promise of the big book. But we're not cured of our unmanageability. That's the human condition. That's the daily reprieve. And we treat that problem with steps 10, 11, and 12, a practice of inventory, a practice of meditation, a practice of operating on principles to help other people on a daily basis. That's the antidote to the will problem. I have free will, but in many instances, my will isn't free, and that's why 
unmanageability is in step one. I have free will, but I don't have free will when it comes to managing my own life. What does Bill mean by that? We'll, we'll, we'll take a deep dive at that. In the doctor's opinion on Roman numeral 25, I'm going to just comment on some highlights as we go through the doctor's opinion. Originally, the doctor's opinion was in the main body of the big book. The first edition, if you've ever seen a copy or a replica, page one starts with the doctor's opinion. At some point down the road, probably in the one of the printings of that first edition, or maybe with the second edition, I'm not sure, Bill moved the doctor's opinion to Roman numerals because he wanted the textbook, pages 1 to 164 of the big book, to be written by alcoholics, and Dr. Silkworth wasn't an alcoholic. So now it's in the Roman numerals. And I asked you to ask yourself, so what is the doctor's opinion? That's the title. I believe the doctor's opinion is that we have a problem of the body and a problem of the mind. And it's a particular opinion with regard to the problem of the body. He says here we have a medical estimate of the plan of recovery. Remember I talked about the big book as a textbook. Plan of recovery. Blueprint. It says in the bottom half of the page, in the course of his third treatment in 1934, Bill was hospitalized in September. He was hospitalized again in November, and he was hospitalized in December. That was his final hospitalization. In town's hospital with Dr. Silkworth. Finally, he had enough exposure to the Oxford group and work the steps of the Oxford group there in the hospital on his second day of hospitalization. You could look at his story on page 13. And he had on his third day of hospitalization, his spiritual mountaintop experience, a mystical experience that changed his life and ours. A possible means of recovery. The means of recovery here is not to go to meetings. The means of recovery here is not to pray to God for recovery. Look at what he says here. This is Bill's writing now. The doctor's opinion is in a different type. Part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to others, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. That's the heart of the matter for recovery. Yes, prayer and meditation is important for a connection to power and guidance. Absolutely, step 11. But many people get lost in uh, their own lives and the recovery that comes inevitably with doing these steps, and they get a little complacent with regard to using their time to helping others. Each person has to identify what is balance in their lives. I know some people that don't go to meetings and they don't have a sponsor and they have a vital life and recovery, but they help other people in a very quiet way, not in the fellowship of AA, but just in terms of their profession and they do it for fun and for free. That's the point of helping. That's the point of service. When you get paid, it's a career, a job. When you help others for free, that's what the 12th step is about. Professionals sometimes get very confused in that area and they pay a big price. On Roman numeral 26, this is where uh, Bill makes his comments in between the two letters. They were sent at different times. And although the one on Roman numeral 26 is signed by Dr. Silkworth, 
his original letter to Bill Wilson and published in the big book was not signed. He would not attach his name to it. It was too problematic in his day as a scientist to associate himself with anything that had any connection to spirituality and alcohol, both. And so his signature came in later on as AA got some traction and got some recognition as a institution in the country. Bill says, we must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as the mind. Bill suggests later on that we're mental defectives. Well, in fact, he says it right here. We're maladjusted to life, that we are in full flight from reality, that we're outright mental defectives. I didn't like that so much, but I do know it's true now that I've done this work, especially the fourth step. But the doctor's opinion is really about the body problem. He says in that next paragraph that there's a theory we have an allergy. So ask yourself if you have allergies other than food in the addictive sense, um, but traditional, the way people would normally use the term allergy. I have an allergy to cats, and I have an allergy to some forms of fresh fruit. My eyes close, my throat closes, I can't breathe, and I throw up, both with cats and with fruit. It's odd. It happened to me when I turned 30. So I don't have cats around me and I don't eat fresh, thin skin, fresh fruit. I mean, that's my solution. If it was a problem, I stopped it. I didn't ever see before I stopped drinking that I had a drinking problem that was very similar. When I started, I could not stop. And it happened over a 20 year period regularly. There's the problem of the mind. I could not stay stopped and I could not see that I did not see. We'll get to that in the, in the following assignment. An allergy is a abnormal reaction to a substance. I have an ab, most people can be around a cat and many people have cats. I had a cat until I was age 30. Then I couldn't be around a cat any longer. My body changed. The manifestation of an allergy is some type of a physical body reaction. I have no control over what happens in my eyes and my throat and my chest and my breathing. Now we get to the doctor's opinion here on page Roman numeral 27, and he talks about altruism, and he talks about the unselfishness of these men, entirely absence of profit motive, and having a community spirit. Again, they believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. It was very brave of him to put that word power with a capital P in there. That's as close as he comes to talking about spirituality. At the bottom, he says, of course, you need to be freed from your physical craving. There's where the doctor's opinion is using craving from the dictionary definition. I woke up this morning and I, in loose terms, craved a cup of coffee because I am habituated to have a cup of coffee every morning. I have one cup of coffee, that's it. I used to have iced tea at lunch. I don't anymore because of the caffeine influences my sleep at night, even at, at noon. Coffee is not a problem for me. But the dictionary says craving is the desire for, the anticipation of, the longing for, both the taste and the impact of coffee. He's using the term craving here in a very different way than he does on uh, page 29, for instance. He says, after they have succumbed to the desire again, the 
phenomenon of craving develops. What does he mean by that? In my terms, when I take a drink of alcohol, the alcohol chemistry mixes with my body chemistry and creates a combination like fire and gasoline. And now we know from science that there's a particular chemical result that produces acetone into my cellular structure. And when my cellular structure gets acetone, my cells demand more L acetone. It's a biological problem. That's why the doctor's opinion is so important to understand what he means by craving. It happens after I take a drink. A food addict's craving begins after they have the first bite. Now, of course, the alcoholic as well as the substance addict, whether it be food or drugs, has a physical conditioning and habituation that in fact, I had the four or five o'clock quote craving in the dictionary sense without ever having had a drink that day, I would have a really big compulsion desire to drive for having that drink. You see what I'm saying though, that's a different kind of craving. That's not the craving in the doctor's opinion. That's why it's so, so very important to understand what the doctor is saying here. The craving never happens until after, the, the craving the doctor's talking about never happens till after I have the drink, till after I have the bite. This is repeated over and over again. I'm at the top of page 29. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope. Well, then he defines as we have a spiritual awakening, a psychic change, easily able to control the desire for an alcohol. Now we're talking about desire, not craving in the dictionary, in, in the um, big book sense, but desire in the Webster's definition of craving desire. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. This neutrality to alcohol can be accomplished. This neutrality toward our addiction can be accomplished by doing steps four through nine. That's the implication here as, my, as I understand it. At the bottom, uh, Dr. Silkworth reinforces this understanding of the word craving. They took a drink or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount. Here the chronology of this. I took a drink and it produced the craving. This is the doctor's opinion. This is what he was seeing over and over again in the alcoholics that he was treating. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. This is a biological craving. It's not conscious. It's not a feeling. It's not emotion. It's not a thought. It's a biological. If you put black ink into a jar of clean water, the entire water will be diluted to black. That's what we're talking about. This chemical interaction of alcohol with my body, or in your case, with food and or sugar and or starch, whatever the chemical constituents are of the food components, that's what triggers the chemical reaction in your cellular structure. This Phenomenon of craving causes people to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue the fight. Page 30. Bill doesn't tell us exactly what that means. My speculation is the supreme sacrifice means suicide. Many alcoholics commit suicide rather than deal with the recurring relapse, the cycle of despair. 
He gives us then classifications of various kinds of alcoholics. And, but in the middle of the, of the page, page 30, he said, there are types that are entirely normal in all respects except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They have one symptom in common. They cannot start without developing the phenomenon of craving. Please hear the chronology. If you think I'm being redundant, I am. It's such an important point. And sometimes people have a very difficult time because they've been so conditioned to the Webster Dictionary definition of craving and their own experience with craving that they can't really hear that that's not what the doctor's talking about. He's talking about what happens after you take the bite, after you take the drink, after you take the hit, after you make the, the bet. It may be the manifestation of an allergy. So he's a medical doctor. He's, he's making a comparison with what he knows in terms of biology. This differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. And of course, then he concludes with the, what we already know, because we've heard it enough and we've experienced it enough, the only relief is entire abstinence. Well, that's pretty straightforward in alcohol and drugs. That's why the food addiction is, I believe, the most difficult one to deal with and navigate. You can't be entirely abstinent from food. You would die. So you have to figure out what foods are comparable to the alcohol and or the drug. Most chronic addicts are doomed. This is what he means by no choice, powerless. What is the solution? So now he's going to wrap up his opinion. And he's not going to talk about the body any longer. He's going to talk about the solution now. He's saying in the middle of that paragraph that he came across an alcoholic who accepted the plan outlined in this book. And he got free. Beginning in halfway down the page, he talks about another alcoholic who he had personal experience with, who was hopeless. We doubted anything would actually work for him, even what Bill Wilson had on the following page and the end where the letter ends, Roman numeral 32. He said, this man became sold on the ideas contained in this book. Notice, here's a second doctor's opinion. The first was a scientific opinion, not based on research, but based on his experience. The body is a problem of biology. But the second now opinion that he has, based on his observation is, this book, this process that Bill Wilson introduced seems to be effective. The ideas contained in this book work. So he said at the bottom, the final paragraph, read the book. <laughs> it's so like straightforward, read the book. And then remain to pray. Read the book. And you'll find out that the solution to the addiction problem is a spiritual solution. Very brave of him. Finally, he did add his name to the material. Next week, we'll look at the balance of the assignment, which is to look at the first eight pages of Bill's story. Try to read it from the perspective of, of course, the set aside prayer and identify not obviously with his drinking. That's not necessarily how you're going to identify with him or his lifestyle, but how did he drink? What was his relationship with his addiction? How does that compare to yours? How did he think? How did he feel? How did he behave? Those are the questions to ask so that you can look at and identify with Bill 
rather than highlight the differences where there's no identification. And then finally, on uh, pages 17 to 23, the final piece of that we'll cover next week. While you're doing that, take a look at, as I say, those questions in the Way of Life document on the body in that worksheet. You don't have to answer them by next week, but by the following week, I will be giving you that assignment. Bill ends that on page 23 with the very common sense solution. If in fact the body were the only problem, if taking the drink were the only problem, then stop it. Well, and he says right there on page 23, of course, you can't just stop it. You can stop. You have lots of experience in stopping. The problem is we can't stay stopped after a day or a week or a month or a year or a decade. I know many people that relapse after a decade or two. Why is that? Because they don't understand unmanageability, they don't understand the spiritual malady, they don't understand the instructions of not cured and daily reprieve. More about that later. All right. So now I would like to talk to some folks. I realized I was not being honest with myself. I was not facing um, my food issues again, um, and everything was fine, but it wasn't fine. I was eating sweets again, and um, as soon as I eat them, I feel sick, but I can't put them down again. I'm back to oh, the first step again, or the... Yes, you are. Yep. What happens after you have the first bite of food? I have to eat the rest of it. That's right. Yeah. That's the allergy. Yeah. That's the craving. That's exactly right. Whether you get sick or not is irrelevant. Whether I black out or not is irrelevant. Whether I go to jail or not is irrelevant. Whether I wreck my car or not is irrelevant. Right. I had the second drink and I didn't intend to. See what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And it wasn't my choice. Once I've had the first drink, the second drink is my biology's choice. Yeah. That's what we mean by that's no That's where choice. I am. Yeah. That's where I that's am. you are. I have not wanted to accept that I wasn't like other people. And I have to tell you, I have loved my sobriety. I have loved being a member of this fellowship, but I always felt like there was something wrong with that statement. And especially the allergy, because I'm a nurse, you know, and I was like, but it's not an immuno, it's not my immune system overreacting, right? But you know what? Stop struggling and just, I, I have an allergy to certain antibiotics and to tree nuts. I know what happens to my body from the second it touches my lip. And I know what happens when sugar just touches my lips. Like it doesn't have to even go into the bloodstream or a hit of pot right up to the brain. So I'm really grateful that you're teaching us that it's a predisposition of genetics and that it's not about my willpower. It's not anything I've done over the past 16 years. That and I love the recovery of the body in the first nine steps and then, but it doesn't mean we're cured. And the other day, as I was eating, my study group knows this, but as I was eating stale donuts that my son had thrown away out of the garbage, I was like, huh, maybe that's not normal. Maybe it's not normal. Doesn't matter. Like he says, there's entirely normal people here on page Third, uh, yeah, 30. Um, so I don't have 100 pounds to lose. So I didn't end up in jail like you did. 
it doesn't mean I don't have the same disease. Man, sorry, I'll shut up now. <laughs> oh, no, no. We could probably survey the group and confirm <laughs> that what you just described as eating stale donuts from a garbage can is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. not normal at all but it's right. normal for a food addict right yeah. just like i would find drugs in the garbage or not hesitate to smoke someone else's cigarette that i found on the floor back in the oh, day yeah. or or remove a cigarette that was put out in a warm beer and drink the beer <laughs> totally. wow. Ooh, <laughs> we're telling on ourselves here we're disgusting yeah. man it really helped me looking up the definition of these words because I didn't understand, I did not understand what an allergy was. That food, just like other pollens and uh, microorganisms, can be that, but it is. Well, and we're, so we're not, let, let me just, let me just, uh, and I meant to say this when the nurse was on the line, we're not really necessarily talking about a scientific biological allergy. He's more using it poet, poetically from his experience. It, it's a metaphor. It looks like an allergy. So I don't mind your coming to your own conclusion on it. I just want to make sure that we understand what the doctor's opinion is. He's not saying as a medical doctor that it is an allergy. He's just saying it looks like and it operates like an allergy so that we can understand it. Go ahead. It's insidious. It's insidious when, when you go to these meetings like OA or FA, um, I've seen people stand up and talk about suicide and I didn't understand that. I thought, oh, I'm not so bad. Well, I'm way overweight and now my blood pressures started going up and I have other problems and I am committing suicide when I continue definition. to- By definition, to, you're killing yourself. I am. And I don't want to do that. I want to be here for my children and my 12 grandchildren. So thank you so much for continuing to teach us and help us understand. A production potter in my own studio for years. And no matter where I was or what I was doing, I felt compulsive, like I'd never have enough clay. And I was going through a, a one ton of clay a month alone in my studio and selling it and it was never enough never enough never enough never enough and it just seems like i just i am that person of like it's never enough and then it's way too much and food is that currently well so, if it's not if it, it, it see the the issue here is like the game whack-a-mole which i've never played but i've heard about and that is a board game where there's a uh, board with holes in it and there's a gopher that, whose head is, comes up out of one of the holes and you hit it with a hammer and it goes down but comes up in another hole. And that's the same with addiction. I know lots of recovered, recovered, meaning they're not drinking or thinking about drinking alcoholic men, five, 10, 15, 20 years of abstinence from alcohol who are 50 to 200 pounds overweight or their serial uh, infidelity people in terms of their relationships or they're addicted to pornography in a way that interferes with the quality of their life. So addiction will pop out from a different avenue if in fact we don't get to the source and cut out the cancer, that's what this work is. This work cuts out the cancer because it goes deep in the surgery through steps one through nine, but the cancer is never removed, Bill says. We're not cured. So we have to continue radiation and chemotherapy and surgery in steps 10, 11, and 12. Yeah with regard to our unmanageability, the spiritual malady. But all of this will become more and more clear as we go through, certainly, the, the full uh, journey on step one. I wanted to say to you that uh, after years of sobriety, when I first took that first step years ago, when I heard that powerless over alcohol, 
in my mind, Herb, I mean, I've always been a person that felt like I could, you know, physically do most things. I could do whatever I wanted to do. I remember telling a counselor one time that I pretty much had control of everything. Whatever I wanted to do, I could do it. And he just looked at me and shook his head and thought, oh, boy, I got a real live one here. But A real American. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> honestly, Herb, for the powerless part of that first step, in my ignorance, all these years, I have looked at it as I do not, I am not strong enough to control this alcohol because I always thought that I should know better. You know, Bill says in his story, where had been my resolve? And that, that was it for me for sure. But for it was always, even though I heard it in AA meetings and I heard people talking about the allergy and that we don't have any choice in the matter, I always thought, that for me, powerless was I just wasn't strong enough. And, you know, I think through my sobriety, even though sobriety in my mind and, you know, in my life has been a huge gift and blessing, I've had this serial sober suffering. Something's not quite right. And so, you know, I'm in the workshop now because even after years of sobriety, uh, you know, I want, you know, the best sobriety that God has to offer. And I'm wanting to go to any length to do that. Answer to your question, I'll give in a simple way without unpacking it, because we will, toward the end of the step one assignments, talk more specifically about it. And that is, it's about unmanageability. The first half of the first step is about addiction. That's what we're talking about tonight. What happens when I put it in me? I have an allergy reaction that the doctor's opinion calls a craving. Okay, I don't have a choice. Biological. I pounded that one home, I think, sufficiently. I, I gave a preliminary hint at the next assignment, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks. So why not just stop? Bill says it on page 23. Well, if you're suffering from addiction, stop it. Oh, you did, but you couldn't stay stopped. Yeah, that's a problem too. It's a bigger problem than the allergy. It's about the obsession. And then we get to step 10 and Bill says, great, you've gotten relief now. You've got 10, 15 years of sobriety. You have abstinence and you don't even give it a second thought but your life isn't the way you'd like it. You have this deep yearning because there's a black hole in you that's never satisfied and you're restless, irritable, and discontent. That's the unmanageability. That's the spiritual malady, which is treated in that final session that we'll have on step one, looking at assignment number five. So if, let me not unpack it any further than that, yeah, good. but... but it's why I do this work, not for the first half of the first step for most people. People who are usually dealing with their addictions are not drawn to me. The people who are drawn to me are people with five and 10 and 20 and 40 years of sobriety mm -hmm. whose life is not living up to their expectations and hope or not measuring well against other people's contentment. Yep. I the totally, spiritual malady is my bullseye. Hmm? Yeah, I definitely believe that, Herb, and I thank you so much. Thank you for being here and, and allowing us to have this discussion. I think that's helpful to everybody. I don't mean to dismiss people who are dealing and struggling with their addiction at all, because this work will help there. Um, but my, my real interest is in the spiritual malady and steps 10, 11, and 12, which really foster... Um, that level of emotional sobriety and also spiritual sobriety that one would hope for and expect. Morning, reviewing self-seeking, self-seeking versus selfish. And um, I mean, I always thought of selfish being about my self-will. And I think you make up your own mind as to your definitions. And I use the dictionary to try to get some idea of that. I make those distinction in the fourth column of the resentment inventory. And I give a definition that selfish is my thinking about myself. 
and my self-seeking is my behavior that goes with it. All of it comes from my self-centeredness, which is a survival instinct, a survival instinct, which, which is the core of unmanageability, the spiritual malady. And we have no choice. Mm -hmm. We have no choice over being selfish and self-centered. Absolutely. We have no choice. That's something that's really hard for people to see, especially the Al-Anon and the codependent, mm -hmm. because their experience is, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm all about helping other people until I start asking a lot more questions and we get underneath the motive and the underneath that motive and underneath that motive, we find out it's still about their survival. If everybody would just do what they want to them to do, everybody would be happy and healed. Yep. My sponsor, yeah. I never uh, did something for somebody without expectation, which was true. Um, and I looked up the word altruism in a dictionary. That's that complete turning from that self-centeredness. And altruism is taking actions for the benefit of somebody else without any possible benefit to me. That's lovely. Yeah. And Woo! that. My God, strength. <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> no, it's not impossible. It's possible with yeah. greater strength than our right. own. You know? So there you go. That's uh, right. Well, right. yeah, it's about you making your mind up as to what the definition definitions mean, and it helps me when I make the distinction based on my human structure. I have a mind that knows, and I have a will that decides for action. Yeah. Right. All of the even steps are knowing steps. All of the odd steps are decision and action steps. Oh. That's, yeah, I know. It's, it, it's one of the diagrams in, in step 12 in the Way of Life document. You take a look at that, and, and it reinforces the opening comments that I made about the human structure and the methodology of the 12 steps being totally compatible. This emotional stuff that I carry, this this is what I want to get to the bottom of. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Yeah. How emotional do I get there? <laughs> well, yeah, do this work. Do this work with that intention. Bill Wilson in 1958 wrote an article. Now he's 24 years sober at that point. 1958. He wrote an article that was published in the Grapevine called Emotional sobriety, the next frontier. Mm -hmm. And that's what he talked about. He was 24 years sober and he was exploring it at that point. And what he realized was in the article that attachment to people and circumstances and even AA, his dependencies was what was crippling, crippling him emotionally. Mm -hmm. And in this process with that, focus on your part will bring it into the spotlight and you'll be able to see in the fourth step especially where you're being handicapped by your dependencies and isn't that handicap causing the addictions to kick in to the uh, money it could if it it, it could if it, it's not treated but here you are treating it right i understand that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no that's exactly what bill means by not cure absolutely 100 percent, from my standpoint right yeah. now i agree because i've tried it all and i love god and i know god's grace you know what it's food money shopping whatever it's like god help me god help me god help me all day long but the emotional stuff is killing me you because know how you do you know how you squeeze a balloon that's maybe three quarters full and you put a strap around it what happens when you put a strap around a balloon and tighten the strap in the middle. What happens to the balloon? It's going to pop or it separates in two. It, it, will, it will grow on each side. Right. When, right. We, when we become abstinent in our addiction by putting a container around it, unless we let the air out of the balloon, it will pop out in different areas. What do I mean by letting the air out of the balloon? deflation of the ego at depth <laughs> i love my ego <laughs> all right but oh. but uh, but but as 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 they say in the world of spanish um my mi amigo me mi, mi ego is not mi amigo 
<laughs> my my ego is not my friend. No, it's not. It's not. And in I'm the tired. context, in the context that ego here is not the healthy ego. It's the dysfunctional, attached ego, the dependent ego. Correct. Um, I was a, before I came into the program. I was a vegan. I thought that vegans would be skinny, and I was the fattest vegan I ever met in my life. Um, <laughs> because I would make a wonderful vegan meal. Um, it would serve five people and I'd be the only person eating it. I'd eat the whole entire thing because I can't stop. I cannot stop. I have no off button. It's not always about like taking food out of the trash can. It can be about, you know, being on weight watch and, and fruits, fruits and unlimited points. I would fill my freaking suitcase full of clementine and take them to school and eat them all in the afternoon. A whole case. That's quantities. That's an issue. And that is not normal. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you uh, have the experience and can help other people understand it, not necessarily for themselves, but for other people. That it's not just sugar and flour and some other kind of chemicals that are the addictive source of the problem, but actually quantity itself can be a trigger. Right. And Bill talks about it in the big book. He says that um, there's some place somewhere where he says, you know, if you think you can have one drink, go ahead, have one drink. You know, because the quantity is the same thing. You can't stop with one. You know, you, you can't stop. And, um, you know, that's my reality was I couldn't stop. I couldn't, you know, I would just stuff myself. And you yeah. have your recovery just by, you know, giving it up. And then you're, you're, you know, your life is unmanageable and, and accepting guidance. Um, at first, your guidance is from your sponsor, but that's just symbolic of your guidance being from your higher power. So. But, know, but see, I'm so glad that you're saying it that way. There's a balance here. Um, God is great and powerful and the source of the solution, but I have very difficult time hearing God. <laughs> I need a sponsor who can talk to me about their experience right. and hold me accountable personally. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. I know. Well, you prompted me. Thank you so much. The thing that really jumped out to me is on the bottom of page 28 and the start of 29, where it says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And then it goes over the page. They cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. Alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Restless, irritable and discontent. After they've succumbed, the phenomenon of craving develops and then you go through the cycle. That's pretty much me um, in a nutshell. So that cycle of uh, desperation to have some relief from irritability, restlessness and discontent. Yeah. yeah. Tension. Tension is what is, uh, drives us back to the addiction because whatever our addiction is, it has soothed us. And, and that's it's why, scary. And that's why step 10 says we have a daily reprieve because on a daily basis, we're going to have tension. And, and if we know, don't treat it with the spirit, we're going to treat it with the candy. I've wrestled in this for many, this particular space of being half in the water, half out the water for many, many years. Welcome to the human race. 80% yeah. <laughs> 80, 80 of the people that come in a 12-step program, I don't care what program it is, relapse, suffer, and die. So we're in the minority right now here, kids, who are even looking at a solution of abstinence and then living a spiritual life. Honestly, there have been miracles in my life from the program that I've worked. Sheer miracles. And then when I go to the dark, it's hopeless. And the problem is that we love the miracle and we love feeling free and good. But what happens when we're just in neutral? We're not feeling positive. We're not feeling too negative. We're just in neutral and we're bored out of our minds. And and the tension comes up and we have no resistance because we're not connected to a power. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hear you.
I didn't realize the process addictions that I live with. And um, for example, and I, give me give us one example. Spending money. Oh, spending money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Big one. A big it's one. Yeah. Huge. And you know what? And I've filed bankruptcy twice in my life. Of course, of course. And still that doesn't matter. No, you got the rhythm of it now, girl. Oh, I am so good. <laughs> and you know what's funny? It's like I am in the process of like um changing my home life uh, around um daughter who's now 10 wants to have her own room and we ha I have that. And so I'm all for that. So I'm moving things around and I've been looking on Facebook marketplace and I have been, I've been the process of finding something and going, Oh, I'm going to ask if it's still available and Oh, I got it. Yeah. Or, or I'm waiting. It's I'm such a, so, so I'm, I'm so see the set aside prayer and attitude is working because you're now opening your consciousness to the possibility that there's more going on in you. Yeah, and there is. And um, I've been working with my sponsor lately, and I, I recently had a break, but I came clean immediately after I took the bite. I came clean immediately, and my MO is usually, I don't. Yeah. And then I think I can handle it, and it festers, and then it becomes yeah. even worse. Yeah. So um, step one, I'm I'm getting it. And I understand, like, the it's the obsession that starts before i take the bite that's what it feels like that that's that's exactly right you're intuiting okay. correct and based on the like the conversation i had with aaron mm -hmm. that she put it into behavioral terms you're putting it into the vocabulary of the big book okay all right and we'll be talking about that but tell me about your experience with the allergy and the craving. Okay. I tell myself, first off, I can just have a little bit. That's fine. I can take one bite of peanut butter or whatever. And that's How it. That I'm going to have my absent mood. And then what happens is it doesn't stop there. It does but not it, stop But, but you, after once or twice of failure, then you, you understood it and you stopped it, right? No. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm trying to look back in my history and it, every time I've taken that bite. Alcoholics drink to celebrate success and to cry over failure. So it doesn't matter. We'll find any reason, the tension of happiness and the tension of unhappiness. Yeah. But everybody can have, they relate to the experience. You intended to have a bag, a, a few chips, probably not the entire bag. You yeah. ate the entire bag and, and the few chips itself changed your chemistry. It, it, it absolutely. And, and you, lost, you lost control. The I trigger was pulled, the bullet was fired, and there's no putting it back. And so this went on for hours back yes. and forth, picking yes. up. Yes. But, but see, oh, once... No, but but see, all of that now is drama and story. Yes. All of that is more reinforcement that you lost control. But after you have the first bite, the rest is going to be very predictable cycle. And I did not know that. I did exactly. Know that. That's right. And then I know, now I know it, and it's it's really evident to me. And um, and that knowledge will not stop you from doing it. No, no, it really That's won't. the problem, see. Knowledge is not the key. We do need to know the dynamic of it. We do need to know more about the obsession that was talked about earlier so that we can be more committed to the spiritual program, which protects us both from the obsession and then from the craving. You know, for me, it's a lot of the process things. And, and, in particular, a tremendous, tremendous um, addiction to uh, my iPad and playing computer games. Well, I do you know, know that they've I actually, they've actually now, they have created hospitals for inpatient treatment of technology addicts, especially young teenagers and the gaming. Once you get your alcoholism 
contained through whatever mechanism that you do, and you have the gift of abstinence, hear my words, gift, we can't create it. It's a gift, that abstinence. Many of the men that I see and or work with after five or 10 years become food addicts or become pornography addicts or become work addicts because they're not treating the spiritual malady underneath that's creating the tension that then isn't have an outlet or an antidote with alcohol. It finds a different mechanism like spending was uh, somebody uh, mentioned earlier. Still with me? I am. Yeah. So it's inevitable if you're not spiritually fit, you will manifest some other form of addiction. It's just time to stop. <laughs> I don't, so I don't want if to I took, well, yeah, but saying that and doing it are hugely different things, aren't they? No, well, that's why I'm here. If you could stop I would by have. making a decision, you would. But you can't, so you're here. This process is the deflation of the ego at depth. Spiritual process of deflating my ego by going through these steps, especially four through nine, a relationship with the spirit shows me the truth, which makes me right size. Oh, I've never been right sized. Well, at least um, spiritually, if not uh, physically and emotionally, yeah. right? Exactly. Thanks, and, and, and right size is not the criteria of abstinence. Be very clear on that. I mean, I'm, that it's a component. If there's smoke, there's fire, but it's not the goal for right size. The, the real goal is a relationship with the spirit and then a healthy relationship with food. And, and the idea of abstinence being sort of the, the necessary remedy makes me feel like I need to live in a yurt with no technology, you know, and grow my own food if I'm going to survive, because that's how compulsive I am. Yeah. Well, um, how big is your God? That is the question before, um, that I've been grappling with for a decade. Is sure. Yeah. You need to trade your God in on a bigger God. You need an upgrade in your system. <laughs> That's what we're going to do here. We're going to give everybody an upgrade in their step two, three system. I do want to make a comment about a question that was asked or a comment that was made last time about the Ignatian exercises. There is a Catholic saint, Ignatius Loyola, who had a major conversion experience and created what he called the Ignatian spiritual exercises. He also founded a group of religious priests called the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. Father Ed Dowling, was a Jesuit, a teacher at the University of, of uh, St. Louis, who in 1940 read the big book, went to see Bill Wilson and asked him, did he know who St. Ignatius was? And Bill said, no. Did he know anything about the spiritual exercises? And Bill said, no. And Father Dowling said, good, because now I know what you have here in the big book is an authentic revelation to you personally. Because there's a parallel between the 12-step process of transformation and the Ignatius exercises process of personal transformation. So that's the background to that, just in case anybody heard the question that was raised last week and had any curiosity about it. Father Ed Dowling was Bill Wilson's spiritual advisor for the next 20 years from 1940 to 1960 when Ed Dowling died. It had a powerful influence on Bill and, and the writing of the 12 and 12, which we'll comment on at some other time. I would like to find some answers for myself, uh, how to 
understand that mental obsession and maybe create the same attitude to it as fire sort of thing as as, as sugar and flour. If, if there's anything that you can know or think or remember to prevent the obsession, then you're not powerless and the book doesn't apply to you. Mm. This is what we're going to see in a couple of weeks. Obsession of the mind means that I'm every bit as powerless over my mind when I get this obsessive thought as I am when I take the first piece of cake or the drink in my case. I'm powerless. So there's nothing that you can know or think or feel that's going to prevent the obsession. Right. Um, this isn't in the big book, but the bottom line is you're screwed. Yeah, thank you for laughing. I'm glad. I, I took a risk there. <laughs> that's not in the big book, but that's the point. That's the point of now our relationship with power is the only shield against that thought, that obsession. And that's what it means by not cured that we are vulnerable to the obsession if we don't have a spiritual shield. If we have the spiritual shield, we're protected. We don't even have to think about it. That's what the book says. We're placed in a position of neutrality. Yeah. That's freedom, see. There's the, where the freedom is. I thought, you know, I, I thought being abstinent would be like, put the Band-Aid and now I can calmly go about fixing my life. It's not at all. It's like ripping off a Band-Aid and opening up a floodgate of all the stuff that isn't working and how because I don't you have, don't have you don't have the anesthetic now. Exactly. And I feel really stressed and really anxious. Like everything is like, everything is unmanageable. Um, and... One of the, I guess, the biggest things... It's not, it's not that everything became unmanageable, <laughs> but you became conscious that that's the life that you were living in anyway. Now you don't have the anesthetic to dull your consciousness. You took off the earmuffs. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, um, and the thing with that, um, I, I'm becoming aware that there's a lot of pain with that there's a lot of like, I, I feel it's, I've been given this awareness of that. And, you know, I'm having all these, all these beliefs revealed to me, this idea that, you know, when I, um, when I get abstinent, my life will be okay. But the thing is, that what's been revealed is abstinence is not the key. It's a spiritual life that's the key. And then underneath that is the fear that I, I'm fearful that I don't have what it takes. Um, almost, almost overriding. That's why we looked at the set aside prayer and attitude, but that's especially why I introduced everybody to step 10 and 11 tools, the meditation and the prayer and the inventory. Those are tools to confront and deal with your fear and the tension that comes from your beginning to be abstinent and con more conscious. The action that is recommended is the 10 step action of talking to somebody, your sponsor, step guide, good friend about this on a regular basis so that you are connected with somebody who can confirm that this is going to pass it won't be by Friday, but it <laughs> will pass. It might not be until you get into the second step. It might not be until you get into the fourth step. At some point, the level of what you're feeling right now will subside a little bit, enough for it not to be so uncomfortable. I am. Um... Yeah, thank you, Herb. I, I have actually a couple of sponsors, um, one of which has been through your programs numerous times, and both of them have lives that I want, you know? So it's like I trust in that. I trust yeah. that this program That's is it. worth it. That's it, yeah. So I have that. Um, 
and and I have done your workshop sort of all the way through, but it's like I see that I had this veil still over my eyes of like walking through the program and I'm just going to pick and choose what I want, but it's like I'm here now and I've been through the program, you know, this one once and another time. This is the third time I'm writing inventory, but new stuff is coming up and this new layer and I realise that, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a commitment. It's a life commitment. I'm never, you know, it's like it's starting to dawn on me. It's like it's that's a weight, I think, that I'm feeling. And I don't want it to be and it doesn't need to be. But first of all, it's not a sentence to a prison of suffering while you do this work for the next 30 years. No, I have been free for over 30 years. That gives me hope. You know, it's like, yeah. 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 Hold the model up of people who you see are a witness to the impact on their lives, and you know that it worked in them. You have every reason to believe it will work for you. Thanks, Ed. For those of us that are, that are recovered from our addiction and are here mainly for the unmanageability, yeah. I think you said we don't need to do like alcohol or drugs or food, whatever it is, that we can pick whatever it is that's bothering us today. Was that right? Well, um, yes and no. I remember sort of that conversation, but what I meant by that was the people who are abstinent and are not having problems with their abstinence are here for probably some other reason that their life appears to be not working or that they've had enough experience with the 12-step process to know that there's more awakening available from a very positive standpoint. But I also want to expand on that now that you've raised it, and that is I encourage everybody to challenge themselves with regard to their Prime, their primary addiction as to even if you're 20 years sober, re-challenge yourself as to why do you think that you're an alcoholic? What is your experience with the allergy? What is your experience with the obsession? What is your experience with the addiction? So that you perhaps with the information that I'm sharing uh, and the process that we're sharing together, that you would have a deeper experience with the no choice and powerlessness of your addiction. Okay. Does that make sense for you? Uh-huh. Yeah. And then I was going to ask, could fear be an addiction then? Yes, you can become addicted to fear. You can also become addicted to thought. Absolutely. We can become addicted to most everything, <laughs> especially okay. those, those who are predisposed to addiction. Okay. So yeah. if fear would be a process addiction, so you get the fear and then you'd have the reaction, which is the biochemical reaction. Well, that's what emotion is. Yes. And so maybe for, if someone's addicted to fear, it'd just be more intense people that, could say, well, it's probably say? better that we're not talking about theory. If you wanted to make it practical and talk about your own personal experience rather than trying to be hypothetical, I think we'd have a much better conversation. Okay, so like when I, something happens and I get in fear and it just, it triggers something in me and then my heart starts beating, I start fantasizing the very worst. I get paranoid, I start calling people to get reassurance, and then I withdraw and avoid everything. That's sort of my yeah. pattern. Yeah, that, that would be a typical reaction of fear, but where does the addiction come in for you? Uh, because it happens over and over. And you can't stop it. I can't, no, I can't stop okay. it. Yeah, so that seems to be then there's been a pattern in very similar parallel to the heroin addiction, because heroin, of course, is a chemical and fear is based on uh, the production of chemistry. So, yeah, it's probably very parallel. Now, um, 
in the same way we can habituate to an addiction like that, we can in fact decondition ourselves or extinguish that sometimes on our own and sometimes with professional help. But underneath the underneath the underneath, Bill says that we're powerless over our fear and that we pray for its removal. And I guess it would really depend on how hijacked we have been by the addiction and how embedded it is and habituated to us as to whether we have sufficient power or not. I don't know. I, I Again, I'm now I'm into a little bit of a hypothetical because I don't have any knowledge or experience with that. Okay. Well, yeah. good. Thank yeah. you so much. What I do know is um, that fear is treated with this inventory process very effectively. And if we find that it's not treated adequately by the spiritual or inventory process, that professional help might be necessary because it could be connected to something psychological or emotional in like a trauma or something where professional intervention might be necessary. Okay. Yeah. In the two programs I'm in, AA and A Vision for You, OA, it's um, through reading the doctor's opinion. We don't work with people until they've got, you know, maybe 48 hours of clean time from food and whatever from alcohol. And I... Well, no, wait, 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 wait. Okay, right. so that's what I wanted to find out. Yeah, let's, let's separate out your two experiences. Nobody says in Alcoholics Anonymous that you don't work with somebody until they have 48 hours of sobriety. Nobody says that. Okay. All right. Well, now, I, I guess... know in the food program, there might be a little different approach. That's why I'm sensitive to it. So right. um, why don't you, so, um, so take it from there, but maybe what, ask your question and let's see where it goes. Well, and I heard yesterday that some people were still in their food. Um, that were on this call. And yes. I, I just received a call from uh, somebody who is really struggling giving up the food. And I thought about inviting her to this, but I didn't know if you felt, do, is it possible to get the full benefit from it while you're in food? Could this be part of well, getting let away me, from let the me. food? Uh, yeah, no, I've had the question before, and it's a good question. It comes from a misinterpretation of the big book, quite frankly, where okay. it says somebody needs to have their brain defogged before they can be talked to them and have a psychological uh, sort of a connection that's uh, taken out of context and applied to the food situation inappropriately from my standpoint. So here's a real startling black and white question. Herb, would you work with somebody that is still drinking? The answer is yes. Okay. All right. Well, is the first step about no choice and powerlessness or is it not? Yes. How can somebody quit drinking if they're powerless? That is true. Well, they, the they answer can white knuckle well, it. Wait, they can be wait. locked up. <laughs> well, the answer the answer is they if they're powerless, then they must find power in order to stop drinking. How do they find power? By finishing the first nine steps. Herb, do you mean that you would work with somebody that's drinking and taking them through the steps? Absolutely. On the day that I'm working with them, if they've had a drink, I won't. So they have to come to me with at least a little bit of abstinence from alcohol or at least very little alcohol, and we will begin the work. Now, the obvious answer to the situation is that somebody works the steps much better if they're not drinking. 
<laughs> somebody works okay. the steps much better if they're not binging. Absolutely. All right. But, okay. but a lot of people really do not understand that powerless means no choice. And how can somebody be abstinent from food in order to work the steps? If they could do that, they wouldn't need the steps. Now, I, I don't have an experience in the eating program, but I have an experience of logic. And I have an experience with the 12 step process. And I know that the big book says, you're not guaranteed freedom from your addiction until after you finish the ninth step. I mean, that's really clear. Okay. We enter the, it says we enter the world of the spirit. So I'm not saying one way or the other, other than I had a man come to me. I think I may have mentioned that who had uh, struggled in and out of the program for 10 years using crack cocaine. And uh, I knew he really was so addled in his mind that I almost didn't want to talk to him. I certainly didn't want to try to take him through any type of a step process because he just, he couldn't focus and he couldn't remember. And um, I said, you know, there's only two solutions here. One is prayer because you're powerless. And the other is to help other people because you're human. And those are the recommendations in the big book. So I would suggest that you pray for a creative way to help other people. You don't have anything that anybody wants. I don't know how you can possibly help anybody, but go away and pray about it and see what happens. And he came back a week later and he said, I have three days of sobriety because down the street from me is an old folks home. And when I went there to see if I could help, they said, yeah, you can play checkers with the old men. And I've been doing that. And I stayed sober ever since. Wow. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, that's just, that's such an extraordinary example. I couldn't quote you another one. Mm -hmm. But it is enough of an example to tell me that if somebody wants this thing, they will follow direction. And the direction would be certainly go to meetings and pray because you're powerless and follow direction and, and have a sponsor and be accountable for that uh, incremental direction. So if some, you know, it's, uh, Bill says, I believe in uh, chapter five, it's about rigorous honesty. He says on page 58, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, dash, then you are ready to take certain steps. So that's, that's my commentary on that. Okay. Did that, did that address your questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. No, great question. Good. That asked if a person should work with somebody who was an abstinent. Well, that's where I was when we first started this uh, workshop a couple of months ago. And you told me to just keep coming and to keep you posted on how I'm progressing. Doing really well with a great sponsor, got some days abstinent now, heard for the first time, and I'm talking, I went to eating disorder rehab in 1990, so 30 years ago, I've been doing this roller coaster ride, it's the first time I've ever had it explained to me, Dr. Silkworth's definition of craving, read it, you know, after we've succumbed to the desire, it just never clicked until you explained it about the uh, biological down to a cellular uh, process that happened. And so that's fresh on my mind and been helping me daily. You know, why would I eat anything extra get back in that behavior again when I know powerless. I guess what my question is, uh, just wanting that insurance policy because I'm doing my quiet time, I'm talking to my sponsor, I'm writing down my food plan, making phone calls, doing some tools, stay abstinent, but I'm still scheming. I'll, I'll finish my meal and be scheming about what can I have extra. So 
and I see people with long-term abstinence go to day one again. So I know they're not to set anybody on a pedestal. It's all we're all just one bite away, one day at a time. We wake up. It's a new 24 hours, but I just need to hold on, trust this process. I'll get a better foundation with step one as we go, or am I just creating a um, sabotage in between my ears? Am I making any sense, I guess, is my question with what I've just said. Well, you're, you're making eminent sense, as I think what you I heard you say is, that not only are you understanding a little bit more about what the book is saying, but you're also having an experience of some freedom and management of your food issue. And that you also have an awareness that there's still some undercurrent of nastiness with regard to your food. My words, not yours. And I just want to, uh, so, and the bottom line question is, are you on the right path? You're 100% on the right path with the experiences that you're having. And I want to just confirm that the path is steps one through nine. And at the end of the path, Bill says on page 85, 84, we enter the world of the spirit. But then on 80, 85, he tells me what you want to hear. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. But hear the language, hear the verb. We feel we had been placed. Hear the gift, hear the deliverance. Mm -hmm. It's not because you did the steps. Because if it's a result of you doing the steps, then you have the power. Somehow, however, there is some type of a connection to my willingness and action and the gift of grace. And I believe you're already experiencing the gift, mm -hmm. you see, sure. and you're receiving it. It just hasn't completed itself yet. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm grateful for the gift of abstinence because it is a, it's definitely a gift and it's not my doing. I guess I'm just trying, I want that insurance that I can keep trucking and it's on just a, one day at a time. On a daily basis, the two components for me in terms of my attitude are a gratitude that I received a gift and a humility that I received the gift. Because I didn't ask for it and I didn't work for it. In my case, I was given the gift before I ever came to AA of freedom from alcohol. But I didn't get freedom, going back to the other comment that somebody said about the human life and steps 10, 11, and 12, I didn't get freedom from unmanageability until I was four years sober and did this work for the very first time. And then I began, I began to get free of unmanageability, meaning restless, irritable, and discontent in the program sober. And that took another few years of, of some continuous work. And I haven't been restless, irritable, and discontent for over 30 years. That's the ticket. That's what's been going on, irritability and just discontent not comfortable being uncomfortable and, uh, and if you continue being uncomfortable you will relapse because it's the only medication that we know and that's the whole point i got you a, a constant consciousness in search of getting into alignment with instead of being out of alignment with and that's why step 10 says, when we're disturbed, know that you're out of alignment. And the whole purpose of the process is to put ourselves into it. We put ourselves, or at least want to be, placed in alignment. And there's the, a mystery that gives me the attitude of gratitude and humility. The mystery is, 
how did it happen and how do I sustain it? Because the outcome is disproportionately larger than my contribution to it. And that's where I come with grace. But it wouldn't happen without my willingness and I can't explain that combination. I can just observe it. I, I always feel that I'm kind of like every day I have to remember I am powerless. I am at step one on almost everything in life as far as control. Well, I, I partially agree with you if it's about unmanageability, the second half of the first step. I do agree that daily we need to be conscious of that. But being conscious that I'm powerless over my addiction is irrelevant. Because, in fact, my consciousness will not treat my powerlessness. Mm -hmm. Knowledge and willpower are not powerful enough. I don't have a choice. What I do have a choice is accepting my unmanageability, my selfishness, self-centeredness, my spiritual malady, and treating that on a daily basis, as you just indicated, with 10, 11, and 12. Mm -hmm. That's what I need to remember to do. And then I never have to think about my addiction again. I rarely think about alcohol or my addiction. Rarely. Because it's not relevant. I've been mm -hmm. placed in a position of neutrality, but I'm constantly thinking about my self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. I'm a recovered narcissist, and you never recover completely from that. And see, I feel I'll never recover from uh, the addiction to flour and sugar. It will always be there. And well, I can't... But, but, but you're using recovered in a different sense. The big mm -hmm. book is very clear. Look at the title page how thousands of men and women have recovered. You're not thinking about it and you're not using it. Therefore, mm. you've been placed in a position of neutrality. If mm. you haven't been placed in a position of neutrality, if you're still struggling, then there's something wrong with your spiritual condition. Uh -huh. That's what Bill says very clearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and also too, like, just that whole sentence going back step one, it remind me of snakes and ladders, you know, Zoom, oh, there I go back to the bottom again. I didn't, <laughs> so I just had to throw that out too. But I understand what you mean. It, it could be that you, you have passed and you, you've got neutrality. You can, you can get that with the addiction. Well, no, that's what the book promises. Look on page 85. Mm -hmm. The words are very yeah. clear. And you yeah. either have neutrality or you don't. And if you don't have neutrality, there's something wrong with your spiritual condition. I'm not right. judging it or being negative. I'm just evaluating it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Wonderful comment question. And uh, let's end with the serenity prayer and we'll pick it up again next Thursday. Please join me tonight in the serenity prayer. What can we influence? What can't we influence? I cannot figure that out. I need the gift of wisdom. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Thanks, everybody.